Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer, entrepreneur, and podcast host, Nick Ruffini. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? This is Rich Redman. This is another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show, and it's a really special day because technically the address says I'm in Los Angeles, California, but it's kind of the Studio City area. I'm a stone's throw from the legendary jazz club, The Baked Potato. Across the street is Universal Studios, a lot of the back lots. This is a very exciting day because this is the first episode that I'm doing on location from Los Angeles, and my guest is a longtime friend, and today's guest is Mr. Nick Ruffini. What's happening? How are you, bud? I'm good. How are you? It's so nice to have you here. It's good to be here. Um, for those that aren't in the know, Nick is the founder and executive producer of Drummer's Resource. You're saying, what is Drummer's Resource? Drummer's Resource is the world's number one podcast, right? Drumming podcast. Drumming podcast. Not number one podcast. Yeah, but I'm thinking for drummers, it is the number one resource. And what's so crazy about it is I think you started in 2013. 2013. And I was, I, I have a vivid memory of sitting on my couch in Nashville, having the conversation with you because I was one of your first guests. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, so that's what we, like, before we get into this, because I, I was going to save this to the end to say yeah. this, but I figure if people get bored with what I'm saying then they won't hear it at the end. So I want to say it now. Okay. So Because I, will, I, I need to publicly uh, thank you for everything that you've you've done over the years. Oh, man. For one, like you, you've been so generous with your time over the years. And when we first met, I was still I was still in the restaurant business and, and like I was touring, yeah. but I was still like, I was half, I was like half in, half out of the music business. You and I started chatting back and forth, became friends. You introduced me to everyone at NAMM and, and now we, you know, That's crazy. you know, now we're really good buds. Yeah. And, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to make sure that everyone out there heard this too, that right. I'm publicly oh, man. thanking you. Thank I'm you. so grateful, not only for your friendship, but everything that oh, you did brother. in the industry and everything. So usually we film these episodes today. Um, um, if you're if you're watching this on YouTube, it's going to be just a nice cheesy picture of Nick for like 70 minutes. <laughs> but we just shook hands. It, we just broed it out. Um, well, but I, mean, I had I, to tell you that, man. I appreciate that because yeah. I do remember I did a clinic at um, uh, musicians, not musicians institute, but the Drummers Collective, Drummers Collective in New yeah. York City. Mm -hmm. And you know, afterwards, you and I started chatting a little bit, and then that's kind of what started our friendship. I think that was 2012, man, like yeah. 2011, 2012. Yeah, because it was before I started Drummers Resource. Yeah. Because you started in 2013, and God, we're coming up on. By the time you hear this, we'll be well uh, into the 2020, right? And so that's seven years. And in that time, you had an idea, you executed the idea, you built it, and to become the no world's number one drumming podcast, that's no small feat, you know. And and it's just a great thing. So. Drummer's resource, and now you're van you're branching into all other th all other sorts of things like I am. Mm -hmm. But let's um, you know, we taking you, a, I'm taking a page out of you, your book. Well, you know, you mentioned a lot of things. You mentioned things like um, you know, being in a touring band mm -hmm. and growing up in Philly and mm -hmm. working in your parents' restaurant business. So, so take us back. There's a lot of layers to Nick. You started playing when you're what, 15 years 15, old? Yeah, which is late start. It's late. It's late. Yeah, I you, played. I mean, I played piano right. for a long time. I played piano for like eight or nine years, and I did like, I did, re or um, you know, I had recitals and stuff like that that my parents came to and all but that. That's a great instrument. And that, it was a great instrument. You got I melody, learned, harmony, and rhythm. I learned all of it, right. and then I stopped because I started playing baseball, and I was really into oh, baseball. That's right. And, uh, when I was like, when I was 16, I was like, I need to make a decision if I want to really go heavy in sports mm -hmm. or I want to go heavy in music. And I went, I took music and now looking back, I'm like, if all the stars aligned, I may have been able to like sit on the bench at, in like, in like minor bench warmer, a, you know, like maybe like <laughs> I could, pen. I could like put, you know, the cleats on maybe. <laughs> um, but but so, yeah, so I started playing drums when I was 15 and which I think is late, mm -hmm. right? How old were you when you started? I was you like, were like six, right? six or seven years old. Yeah. But then, you you know, um, 
it's sometimes it's too early. So like, you know, I got feedback from my teacher and from the universe and my teacher was telling my parents like, Hey, this kid's really got a knack for this. And right. this could be a really great thing. But at the same time, I wanted to ride my banana bike and ride my skateboard and play with my star Wars figures. You right, know what right, I mean? right. Still all these years later, I'm still playing with still my star Wars with, figures. You know, I'm going to tell you something that's, that will blow your mind that, so I'd always been, I grew up listening to hip hop because I had an older brother and I was yeah. like, that's what I grew up on. Right. And I always wanted to be a performer, right? whether it be like, I wanted to be like a singer or like a rapper or a dance, right? I didn't know exactly. It never even occurred to me that I could be a musician. It never was like, even in, not that I didn't think I was able to do it. Yeah. It never even, it never, it was never even on That's the That's just radar. some crazy thing that other people do in Hollywood. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. Didn't even think about it. I was like, you either have to be the guy singing or right. the girl singing or dancing or whatever, or I don't know. It was weird. I like, I, I was mm-hmm. like, you, I, I never even thought about, oh, I could, I could do this, but like, yeah, I could play drums or I could play guitar or I could, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in sheltered El Paso, Texas. And so when the police came out with the synchronicity in 1983, I was like, I'm going to do that. Right. I don't know what that is. The only information I had as tumbleweeds were bro- blowing past my front door was watching concerts on MTV when they had concerts and not yeah. reality shows and then taking some drum lessons and figuring out, I don't, how do you do this? Where do you go? It's not El Paso, Texas. I know, right. I know that. <laughs> right. So, so you're in Philly uh-huh. and you start drumming at uh, 15 years old and then you went to college, right? Did. Yep. And did you, did you finish her? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I got my degree. And what was it in? Uh, originally I went to Villanova for business mm-hmm. and then realized that I there was no music there. And I was like, I need, I, I got to have some sort of music. I was already playing a lot, but I was like, I want to, I want to study more. Yeah. Went to Kutztown, transferred to Kutztown university, majored in music, mm-hmm. minor in business. One morning I went to a percussion class at eight o'clock in the morning. And there was a bunch of people sitting around in a circle hitting on bongos. And I was like, <laughs> this is not Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like this. So I switched my major back. So I got a degree in business management with a minor in music performance. That's, I mean, that's, I mean, you could see the roots of those degrees. I mean, that's a, I think a business degree is, that's a great idea. I mean, I ended up getting two degrees in music education, which qualifies me to teach music and, right. you know, K through higher education, right, right. Um, which really was never my plan. I mm-hmm. wanted to play. So, so I was getting into this whole thing the other day. Um, you know, I listed, uh, you know, Jason Sutter and Luke Adams and, and Adam Gust and all these Craig pile and all these guys that I went to school with in North Texas um, uh, with like, is that really the way to cultivate a career in anymore yeah, in the music business, right. it, paying all those high dollar loans yeah. to go to higher education? Or is it a thing where you, um, maybe you get a degree in business and you just play. If you can play, you can play. If you can play, you can play. But I think, you know, I think what is a big selling point of your podcast is that not only are you talking about sticks and pedals and widgets and gear and playing philosophy, but you're all also talking about how to actually cultivate a career in the music business, like right. invaluable information. And then you, and you always ask your guests, which have included some of the world's greatest drummers. I mean, if I look at a list, I started to make a list and for you non-musicians out there, just think, just think to yourself as I'm looking through my notes, um, a drummer, say like a Steve Gadd, right? Who played for Steely Dan, James Taylor, and Paul Simon, or Chad Smith, the drummer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, or Eric Hernandez, Bruno Mars's drummer, or Jimmy Jimmy Chamberlain from the Smashing Pumpkins, or Brian Fraser Moore from Justin Timberlake. Okay, and that's just scratching the surface. That's, and there's yeah. five hundred other guys. So you make it a point to ask them about the business side of things and how they actually connected the dots and actually put their talent to work. Because mm-hmm. you can be an amazing drummer in your basement and will never get out. Out of your basement unless you start crashing parties and shaking hands and yep. connecting with people that are the gatekeepers mm-hmm. of the industry. And you and I my thing is you either have to understand that side of it or find someone who does that can help you mm-hmm. go down that road. Right. Because there's a lot of people who are like, look, I'm not a business person. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want I don't care about marketing. I don't care about this. I don't care. I just want to play. I don't know how people can say that. Like I, that's are that's, they in the dark? I, some people are. But here's the thing if that's if that's the case then that's fine. Right. Find someone. Find a manager. Right. Find a friend who understands business. But just find don't find someone. Billy Joel's manor- manager. Don't find his don't manager. Don't find that yeah. guy, right? Yeah. So that, that's the whole the whole angle of your podcast is inspiration, motivation, and education, right? right? And this is, you and I are so alike because kind of my mantra is educate, inspire, entertain. So like right. everything I do in life is like I'm trying to affect people in a positive way through education, through inspiration, through entertainment. And I, I, and I found out that we had other commonalities because we were students of Napoleon Hill and Dale Carnegie yeah. and Les Brown and all those guys. Yep. Yep. And, and so for our listeners out there, give us the, um, 
the cliff notes on law of attraction and and why you're into those guys and some of the books that you read i you know the law of attraction thing to me is like you know if if you if you put it out there into the world then it's going to come back to right. you and a lot of that is is foo foo and and a lot of, there's a lot of that 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 maybe people just rely on that and they just sit around and they think, well, I'm thinking all these positive thoughts, right? That's like, I don't think that's going to do shit for you. I'm you have sorry. to can act we, on can it. Can we curse on oh, I think so, yeah. I think so, yeah. <laughs> if not, we'll bleep that out. I think uh, Apple Podcasts will just give us an E. Yeah. Uh, so, but but what I do, what I did learn from studying all of those people, Napoleon Hill, like you mentioned, Les Brown, Dale Carnegie, uh, or even like, you know, even looking at, at newer people, like if you read something from like... Even Olstein. Yeah, anyone. You know, like right? these cats, yeah. Uh, that you really have control over what happens in your life, mm-hmm. right? And, and it starts with your mindset. And once I realized that, it was, and I learned it at a like kind of a young or an, an old age, right? Mm-hmm. Not an old age, but an older age. But it just blows my mind that you really have control over every aspect of your life. Yeah. And once you start taking control of that and ownership, that's the part of life that, that really, for me, like that's when life lit up for me. Yeah. But if you take control or, or if you take ownership over everything, right? Yeah. So like you're not late because of traffic. You're late because you didn't leave your house in time. And right. then, and when you get out of bed in the morning, and you realize, okay, look, let's like a typical uh, Los Angeles scenario. Right. You know you're going to get smacked in the face with traffic, right? Right. right? So as soon as your foot hits the floor, and you get that cup of coffee, and then you're running out of time. And you're like, oh my god, am I going to make it? And then if you let it, the whole day can spiral out of control. Yep. Or you or you can think immediately from a place of gratitude, like, oh my god, I have carpet beneath my feet. I got a good night's sleep. I can enjoy this coffee. Yep. I have a roof over my head. I have clothes on my back. I have people that love me. I have a job. I am enjoying sunny and seventy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is like. There's a lot more good than bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, that, you know, my whole thing is to be happy with where you're at while you're chasing after the other things that you want. Right. You can't like putting off, putting off happiness to this other point in your life. Mm-hmm. It, like that's just a recipe for, for disaster. For disaster. Yeah. It's like, so what, you're just going to be unhappy every day until you get there. And guess what? You're going to get there. And then you're going to want the goalpost is going to move. So you're just, you're, that's a, that's a deal that you're making with yourself that you're just going to be unhappy yeah. pretty much your entire life. And finding small things every single day that you're grateful for. Yeah. And it sounds so cheesy and stupid. But I like, I challenge anyone. I tell I, people I all the time. The shower, I'm man. like, man, it just every day when you wake up, if you just think of something, it doesn't have to be this fucking hour. Sorry. It could be one thing. It doesn't have to be like people are like, oh, I got to have this like morning routine. It's an hour and 45 minutes where I do this. I meditate yeah. with the sun and, the, and you don't have to do all that. Get up in the morning and like be happy for one thing. Like every night when I get in bed, my bed is so comfortable, right? Is it like a hotel style bed? Did you throw down the money for it? Yeah. It's, it's super, com- it's a, it's a split king. Yeah. Right. So like my wife and I have basically it's like separate beds, but they're together. Right. It's and, not a divorce maker, is it? No, it's a bed. Yeah. It's a, it's a king size bed. Okay. But it's two, two individual beds uh. that are together. So like when she moves, I don't wake her up when I'm and I different firmnesses. And every, anyway, it, it, this isn't about the bed. I like the bed tech. But, uh, but every night when I get into bed, I'm like, I'm so thankful that I have this bed to sleep in, especially like living in Los Angeles. You drive around every day and it's very apparent that there is a lot of people who do not have a place to sleep at night. It's bad. You know, it's really bad. It's a bad problem. And, and the fact that like, that I'm going to complain about something Mm -hmm. like no one's having any pity parties for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do I want other things? Yeah, Mm -hmm. but I don't have to wonder where food is coming from. I don't have to wonder where I'm going to sleep at night. I have a loving wife. I have a great family. I have friends. It's like, yeah. Tell us about tell us about your old lady. How long you guys? What's the how long you guys been together? Man, this is like this is part of like the whole story, right? Yeah. Like this is so. I grew up in the restaurant business. I told you, right? And I've always been. We're skipping so many things, but so I'll tie it all together. Yeah. But it's it's kind of a convoluted story. But Italian I'll, I'll tie restaurant. it all together. Italian hey, restaurant. Hey, Rafini. Hey, you're 100 percent Italian, yeah? No, 50 50. Oh, we're my both 50 50. But yeah, you got the Italian last name. Yeah, my dad's 100 percent Italian. My mom's 100 percent Irish. Okay, so now it's opposite for me. Got you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And my mom is like the and most- look how dark I am, dude. I mean- and look how white I am. That's crazy, right? I got the Irish. I got the <laughs> Irish side. 
Uh, yeah, I got the Italian last name and the Irish skin. So I grew up in, or, or uh, I grew up in the restaurant business. Family started it in '74, right? Yeah. We've had five different restaurants. So my whole entire life was I lived a double life. I ran a multi-million dollar business with my family, amazing. And at the same time, I was playing. I was in a band that I grew into like a touring band and everything. And I was back and forth. And I would be on the road, and I'd come home, and then I was in business mode, and then I was in music mode, and I was back and forth. You were always forth. splitting your brain. Always, I, I'd always done that. Ever since, like I started working at the restaurant. I used to leave Little League practice to go to work. Right. Right. And I'd be like, Dad, like, I got a game tonight. And he's like, You got to work. And I would have to go to work. Wow. So, uh, 2011, we uh, were running the restaurant. Everything's great. Every, making money and everything. There's a, there's a, a tiff in the family. Oh, no. My brother, or it's, my. Uh, it's like my, Zildjian and Sabian. My dad, yeah. My dad and my uncle, right? Uh -huh. And they go toe to toe. And, and my uncle had been retired for 20 years. And, uh, and my dad said, all right, well, you want to run it? Here you go. Here's the keys. He hasn't been in in 20 years, all right? He's like, you want to run it? Go ahead. So me, my brother, my mom, my dad, everyone, we all leave, right? So now, in, a course of, in the course of six days, I lost my job, my girlfriend, and a place to live. In 2011? In 2011. Wow. Right? Reason being, I was moving to LA, so the guy's like, this was the first time you moved to LA. I didn't. I never moved. So ah. 2011, I was moved. I was quote unquote moving to LA. I was living with one of my best friends at the time, and I was like, "I'm moving in March." He's like, "Great." So everything happens with the restaurant. Didn't really matter because I was like, "Oh, I'm leaving anyway." But then we had to go to. There was like legal stuff. We had to go to court, all this other stuff. So I was like, "I can't move right now." And he's like, "Well, I already got somebody moving in." So then I go to get an apartment, and they're like, "Do you have any source of income?" And I was like no because i just i just left the restaurant right. so i lost my job so uh so i moved back in with my parents right <laughs> I, I and i turned 30 did your mom like that like i'm gonna cook for you oh uh, yeah she's yeah, yeah, she's yeah. like you can stay as long as you want yeah. uh i get along with my parents really and my parents are like super chill and me too i'm going to like, see him tomorrow man yeah, not like overbearing or anything yeah. so uh this is why i'm saying this is a long convoluted story so we move so i moved back home then my brother's like hey i want to open this other restaurant why don't we do it together? And I'm like, Ron, I don't want to. I don't want to work in the restaurant business anymore. I don't want to do it. I want to move to LA, music, all this stuff. He's like, just do it for a year with me. We'll get it up and running, and then you can move. So 2011, we open up. We open up a restaurant. It's a drive-through Italian place, right? Fast, casual, two to three minutes. It's like Fazoli's, but on wheels. They, it's literally like the same thing, right? Right. And we didn't even know if it's always existed. They stole our tagline, by the way. What was that? Fresh Italian Fast. <sighs> and they moved, they switched it around. Did they me. actually seriously stole it from you? Or it just worked out that way? We started Pronto Fresh Italian Fast, and then they changed their slogan like six months later, and it was Fresh Fast Italian or something like that. <sighs> anyway, so we opened this place in 2011. It's a drive through Italian place, scratch cook meals in two to three minutes. And I was, at the time... I, this was all the wheels were already in motion. So I was releasing a solo record. Mm -hmm. So I was touring to support that. Opening up a restaurant, I got connected with this girl that I went to college with, who is now my wife. Yeah. The only problem was she lived in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is two and a half hours away from where I live. Great bagels. Great bagels. So I'm starting, I'm building a restaurant, playing, dating a girl in Hoboken, New Jersey. So I'm working about, you know, 70 80 hours a week and commuting back and forth from hoboken mm -hmm. right then i meet another guy and he's like oh i got this new drumstick company and i want you to help me run it boso right boso drumsticks. yeah boso. so i was running boso drumsticks running a full-time rest a restaurant full-time playing and dating a girl that lived in hoboken i was working about 120 hours a week wow and i was miserable and you learned a lot from that experience oh my right? yeah i was unhealthy i was like because your everything. new mindset that i that you always talk to me about is like i mean you always tell me um rich you're doing too many things the thing about me is is that all these things have landed in my lap and i can't say no to them because for whatever reason they've been given to me it's like right, it's right, right, right in front of me i've got to figure out a way to do it you're at you're at this place in your life where i do i do one or two things and i execute the hell out of them right. is that where you kind of learn from them from that period yeah, of your life and, and like i was the same way like i'd say yes to everything yeah you're like do you want to do yeah do you want to do this yes do you want to do this yes and my wife God bless her. Like she was the one that would tell me all the time. She was always be like, "He who is everywhere is nowhere." Yeah. He who is everywhere is nowhere, and she would just constantly just say, "Who's that?" Seneca. Seneca. Yeah. And I'm like, no, it's like 
I can do this. I'm yeah. fine. And then I just like I burned out, man. Yeah. Like I had like I pretty I didn't have like a nervous breakdown, but I was like I was on the verge. Like I gained forty pounds. You know, I was just like, eating I was, your car. Yeah, you know, it was just like I was horrible. unhealthy. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't exercising. Right. You know, I'm just like I was stressed to the max. I was sleeping like four hours a night. I mean, it was just it was bad. bad. It was bad. And then finally, uh, I knew that I did I didn't want to stay in that area anymore. I wanted to move up to New York. I wanted to be with with you know, Karen, my wife, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be in music. I wanted to be working in music full time. So I just sat down with my brother and was like, look, you know, I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. And he was, was he like, cool with it? Oh, he's like, you should have left five years ago, you know? Damn. And, uh, and That's my brother and my family knew and he's the greatest he, big brother. You like, guys are tight. Oh yeah. I'm he, the big brother and my, my yeah. family I got two younger brothers. Cool. Like coolest big brother hands down like he would bring me to the he would bring me to the record store mm -hmm. on, at midnight on monday night when the new records came out on tuesday morning and Remember everything that? god and like if it if it weren't for my brother i wouldn't be, i wouldn't be a musician so he played would, a little drums right plays drums yeah. yeah and like but he's like he's a music aficionado so like he introduced me to everything he like i skateboarded because of him i played drums because of him that's great like i skied because of him. like everything that he did i did you know so what is it was it karen karen yeah. karen so what does she do? What's her background? She is a she works in digital marketing. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's she your, works for Gallo Wines. You're kind of in that yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, essentially, you are an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I know that's um, not to get too off track, but you know, you have another podcast that you're kind of called Uncut, right? right. Where you're talking right. about um, creativity and entrepreneurialism and mm -hmm. things meeting at those crossroads. Yeah. The big and, thing is like getting from zero to one, right. right? Like everyone has these ideas. How do you take that idea and make it into something? Mm -hmm. How do you turn it into something? Right. And you, and so I'm looking at some of your first guests were, I had wrote, written them down here. Like some, Chase Jarvis. Chase who's Jarvis. The creator of, uh, of, um, Creative Live, right? He and uh, that world class photographer Jeff Goins. Jeff uh, Goins is a New York Times best selling author. Lou Montuli. Lou Montuli. Do you know, do you know anything? Design Links, the Links browser, right? He invented Netscape. Netscape. GIFs, mm -hmm. like animated GIFs. Wow. Uh, cookies, like not browser cookies. Yeah, browser yeah, cookies, right? not chocolate chip cookies. So he's doing okay. Uh, he's he's yeah he's yeah he's chill. he's fine. He in, he invented uh, Mike Johnston's uh, uh, Groove Scribe. I don't know if you've ever seen that thing. It's a it's a open source thing to to um, transcribe. To transcribe. Yeah, he he invented that. So what is it a thing where it'll hear a piece of music and transcribe it for no, you? No, you can plot the the notes out on a page and then it'll play it for you and it sequences it and everything. Is it's it an pretty, app? Uh, no, I think it's it's on Mike's site. It's I pretty gotta, intense. Though. I gotta get that, Mike. Huh? Yeah. It's free. It's, I mean, it's free. Yeah, Lou Montoli is hands down like the most fascinating person I've ever. He basically like invented the internet with you know he was part of like Mark Andreessen and all those guys. Oh my God, yeah, that's incredible. Yep. So in what you know, thinking back, uh, there's a lot to talk about because there's so many layers to you. But um, when you're talking about releasing a solo record, mm -hmm. I mean that to me is that's very forward thinking, and the fact that you put it out and it got into the fifties on the jazz charts, and then you toured around it, you know, my my path in the music business was oh, I was always backing up singers, and I was right. always on the road or you know in the servitude of backing up some artist, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to put out the Necrophini band, yeah. And isn't some of those tracks the theme song to the podcast, Drummer's Resource yeah, Podcast? Yeah, yeah, okay. Because yep. I was like, well, I wonder where he got that music from. <laughs> it's your music. It's all mine. Yeah. Now, did you write the tunes? Uh, I, I co-wrote them with uh, Johnny DeFrancesco. Tell us about the, the the lineup on that record, and can, where can people find that record? Uh, it's every, you know, it's on, it's on Spotify, Spotify and, and iTunes and okay. all that kind of stuff. The record's called Pressing On, mm -hmm. and I recorded it with Johnny DeFrancesco. So, if you don't know who Johnny is, his brother Joey DeFrancesco is arguably the greatest Hammond organ player in the world. He played with Miles Davis. He started playing with Miles Davis when he was 16. Mm -hmm. Like, he's the real deal. Right. Uh, and these are all Philly guys? Johnny, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Johnny's the equivalent, like, taught uh, John Mayer and, and Joe Bonamassa and all, like, just phenomenal guitar player and had a deal with Columbia or somebody like that. And 9 11 happened. And he was like, you know what? He was like, I'm going to join the service. Then he became a pilot and and flew C one thirties and wow. did all these tours in in Iraq and Afghanistan and like and basically gave up his music career. That's kind of like a midlife aha moment. Yeah, like a wow one eighty. Yep. yep, and gave up pretty much his his career as a musician uh, for a while to go and do that. But and now like he's back and he plays and and everything. But like probably would have had a completely different 
different route. Wow. I mean, but, he was in all like the Fender ads and everything. But that was and, super like, forward thinking of you. So, so what is the name of the record? Uh, Carl, one more time. Pressing on. Pressing on. Yeah. On there, and you know, like having this conversation with you, and I've thought about this before. Like every band I've ever been in, I was the guy. I like I was I was the guy who was the leading. Business guy. I was well. I was like it was my band, right? right? And I think it comes from the entrepreneurial world that I grew up in, where I was like, I want to make, I want to call the shots, I want to be my own boss. So right. then, when I, when the one band Monacy broke up, and we went, and I went to do this solo record, I was also getting like some hired gun, like I was doing some hired gun stuff, and it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. It yeah, just didn't. It just didn't work with me. I get and my that sense sometimes when I'm listening to the 500 drummers that you've interviewed on Drummers Resource that you're like. What's that like, uh, having to show up and play the same 24 songs every day for 20 years? That can't be fun. <laughs> and you don't get to call any of the shots, and you got somebody telling you what to do. I just get that sense that it's like not wasn't a satisfying thing for you. But but here's the trade-off, right? Like, you get to play in front of, you know, you play in stadiums. Would you rather go play in front of 12 people and you didn't help anyone make any money at all? The funny thing is, is that I, I would still go play for the 12 people because, right. you know, I, I mean, at this point in my life, I still love that so much. Right. You know? Talking about playing at the Baked Potato, you know. But who, what, would you rather play at, like... I'll, I'm a, I'm an, you know I'm an arena drummer. I want to play arenas, you know. Right. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Learn by doing, I definitely think, resonates with what we're about here at the School of Rock. I'm Angie McCright, and I'm the owner of the School of Rock in Franklin and Nashville. I would say that the majority of kids that come in have either been sitting in their bedrooms watching YouTube, learning how to play, or they've taken music lessons at some point in their life. We do have a lot of beginners. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can participate in our programs, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced. We don't teach music to put on shows. We put on shows to teach music. Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. There's something about taking the stage on, on a stadium and you hear the yeah. I mean that's a beautiful thing I think everybody should try to experience that once in their life right, you know, right, right. have it be a career goal you know if you're a drummer but at the same time I love going to explore those beacon type theater you know the beacons right, right, and the, right. or even like in middle America where you have this little the town square and they have a theater that's been there for 120 years and it's right. haunted and you see how beautiful the the acoustics are and this the design that went into these old theaters right. I love the intimacy of that I yeah. really do and and, and you played a lot of those anyway. Yeah, right? yeah, and and you know, and you and you'll see, I'll see all those probably again on the way down. You know, if right. I if I if I'm still playing drums, you know, 20 years from now. Right. Um, but no, I mean that's that's a very forward thinking thing. I still one of my goals on this huge list of goals that I have is like put out the, you know, or the Rich Redmond band and have right. it be kind of like a non vocal band, kind of like a fusoid type thing, but like approachable fusoids, mm -hmm. so you can still clap on two and four right. and do a release party <laughs> at the Baked Potato. You know I like what I mean? I, so that's like one of the goals that I have. Um, but it's it's just so funny. Uh, you know, you, you you can't make a full-time living putting out a solo record. You no. know, it's just one of the many things you no. you do, you know, for personal gratification. Yeah. But as far as like making a living, um, I mean, you've monetized this podcast in mm -hmm. a strong way and then you, you've you started consulting and now you have your own media company, Revoice Media, and you have a team of people with you and you guys are like producing some other podcasts. I mean, it seems like you maybe cracked the nut a little bit on Drummer's Resource with the Daniel Glass show. Yeah. Kind of like a, it's like a, a wheel and cog in the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're like, let me just start my own network. And on that network, I have all my, my cheesy little cards here, but you've got, um, I didn't put this in any order, but you've got Wheels Off, which right. is a podcast with Rhett Miller, the front man for the old 97s. Oh, I love that band. And yeah. then there's the LP We Are Rhythm podcast. And then there's uh, Under the Scales and The Good Parts with Andy Grammer. Yeah. And so how does that all work? Because you're the, the, the company, which you started in 2017, is focusing on the development, production, distribution, and seeking out media partnerships for all these shows. Right. So it sounds like a big job. Uh, it sounds it sounds a lot more than it is, right? It's all it's all smoke and mirrors, Rich. Yeah. Uh, the so it started because people were you know people were coming up to me and they're like, hey, you understand how to do this? Hey, like and me? It, yeah. 
Right. No, I mean that's that's what it is. You, you know, helped me like, start this very podcast, and and it's not a it's not that old of a of a medium, and I've been doing it a lot longer than most people. So they're like, hey, you have this this thing figured out. But what I what I see a podcast as is a way for you or anyone to deepen a relationship with their audience, right? So someone like Rhett Miller or Andy Grammer or the LP brand or anything like that, whether it's a brand or an artist or an individual, you can once you deepen that that relationship with your audience, then that means ticket sales, merch sales, VIP experiences, and all that kind of stuff. And I believe that you can use the podcast to do that. So that's always been our angle with Andy Grammer or with, with Rhett Miller or with LP or other brands that right. we work with, with Tom Marshall from Under the Scales. Um, and it's it's an untapped resource. And people who listen to pod or people, let's call, like we call them listeners, right? Which is like, it makes sense. You're like, oh, I mean, they're really consuming the content in many different ways. But, but they're already like, I look at people like you're you're a watcher or you're a listener, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're a watcher, then you are on YouTube all the time and you want to be on YouTube. But listeners listen to music and listen to podcasts and, and it surrounds them when they're in their house or when they're on the road or whatever. Mm-hmm. So getting to those people and deepening that relationship is is huge. And we facilitate that. So we can we say, hey, look, we'll help you not only ideate your your show idea, but then we'll go out and help you find brand partners, right? So it may be like it may be like somebody travels on United all the time and we'll say, Hey, why don't we do a partnership with United to see if we can get your content into their into their on demand screening on the back mm. on the seat backs or nice. use them as a title sponsor. So figuring out one how this artist can can tie into a brand and into their strategy, but then two, how that works with their audience. And do you, you know, the, the idea of like thousand true fans, Are you if you have a thousand true fans and you sell them one, $100 product a year, you make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. So we look at, we look at that. That's sort of the, the internal mode or, or, or mantra that we have is that we're not trying to build the biggest podcast in the world. Well, I mean, would it be great? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But you look at somebody like you look at Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan or or Adam Carolla, Mark Maron, right? Those guys are outliers. Those guys have millions and millions and millions of downloads a month, and they are in they are like stratospheric, right? Like Joe Rogan makes a hundred million dollars a year on his podcast, right? That's insane. That's all timing. But he here, came at the right time. But here's the thing: yeah. there's five of those, right? right? There's 700,000 podcasts out there, maybe more. These are good numbers. Wow. Okay. Right? Most podcasts, 90, I think it's like 93% of them don't make any money, right? And 75% of them get 150 downloads per episode or less. Right. Right? So then so then when you start to look at those numbers, if you can get into 5, 10, 15, 20,000 downloads per, per episode, episode right. right? Joe Rogan and all those guys would sneeze at those numbers, but- if you had those numbers, mm-hmm. or if I have those numbers, you can monetize them. You have those numbers, and, and I'm, work, those I'm numbers. working towards those. Right. Yeah. So, like, yeah. so drummers resource. Like, if I stack it up against against Dak Shepard's armchair quarterback, I'm screwed. Right? He's got millions of downloads a month, but my numbers, they're they're good. Right? No. Hundreds of thousands of people are listening to it a month. I can take that to a brand. I know who my audience is. Right. And then, so, so like, I I think that like niching down and really. I, I'm more about going deep instead of going wide. And mm-hmm. I think that you can do that with podcasts. I love that. Yeah. For me, I, I basically, you know, uh, I've been focusing on my, you know, the low hanging fruit for me is that I know, oh, I know a lot of drummers and I know a lot right. of musicians and, and, I'm, and it's nice to start off with giving a voice to a lot of these, uh, you know, when you, you're interviewing, you know, you're interviewing uh, Steve Gadd and Chad Smith. And then I'm, you know, I'm friends with, uh, Kevin Murphy and Keo Stroud and 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 Paul Lyme and Lonnie Wilson and Eddie Bears, who are these guys that are making the music business go around in Nashville? And I'm like, right. hey, let's bring you out from the shadows and bring you to a to a, a wider audience. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of where I'm starting, and then branching out to to uh, you know bit thought leaders like you, um, uh, you know, uh, my friend Bill Maddox, who, who does body language, mm-hmm. like understanding body language, and then TV hosts, and then I've got a couple comedians like Victoria it. Jackson, and and so it's it's a little fractured, but I'm I, I'm kind of like a fractured your guy i'm in, i'm interested in entertainment i'm in, interested right. in comedy i'm interested in in uh, acting mm-hmm. and um, of course music because it's paid our bills all these years um and, but speaking of ba- uh, brand partnerships 
I'm going to give you a live read right now on our first sponsor, I like which it. is the School of Rock. Nice. And my friend uh, Kelly and Angie McCright in Nashville, they have the Franklin School of Rock and the Nashville School of Rock. And I've known them for got eight or nine years they always have one of the top producing school of rocks in the nation there's 250 locations in the world i think they just had their there's a new one in sao paulo and um they're always doing great things. No, we know that I'm a product of music education. I feel like you're a product of music education. Mm-hmm. Music does great things for the kids. It gives them life skills. It teaches them about teamwork. It talks. It teaches them about persistence and determination and follow through and, um, yeah, taking direction. So if there's anybody out there that is interested in the Nashville area, getting your kids involved in learning bass, guitar, drums, keyboards, singing, becoming a better human being, take them to the School of Rock. There's two locations, and the email address for information is nashville at schoolofrock.com or franklin at schoolofrock.com. And if you're listening to this episode, go back and listen to my episode, episode 25 of this very podcast with Kelly and Angie McCrite, the owners of the School of Rock in Nashville. And thank you for sponsoring the show, Angie and Kelly. That's my live read, man. Not bad for no background pro. in radio. That was pro. No notes. Yeah. They don't know. It, it was 27 <laughs> takes. No, just, <laughs> That's right. You can edit it's with all, Pro Tools. It's all chopped up. We've got our new friend, uh, Nettie, on the board there. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Nettie. Yeah. I love. apologize for, for mispronouncing your name. Well, that could be a thing. Is it, is it, I said, is it two D's or two T's? And she, yeah. Two T's. So, oh no, I said Nelly. I said yeah, Nelly. Yeah, Nelly. So the it's funny- getting hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the interesting thing is, uh, um, all of the crazy jobs that I've had in my life. I was a car salesman when I was in high school, right? Oh, you learned great. Yeah. So I used to leave there. high school. I, I used to leave high school, uh, and I would go. I would leave it at eleven o'clock, and I would mm. go sell cars. At least you weren't a used car salesman. No, well, I sold new and used. Right. <laughs> I'm the youngest certified Chrysler salesperson in history. Wow. They sent me a letter. My co-host Jim right. McCarthy sold a lot of cars. Really? Yeah. So the point of the story is. I would go out and I would introduce myself and I'm like, hey, I'm Nick. And they would say, hey, I'm John and this is my wife, Sandy or whatever. And I would turn around and instantaneously forget their names. Oh my God. And I still do it to this day. When I meet people, I instantaneously cannot remember their names. So this is just like a mental block. You're, you might need a hypno, hypnotherapy for I that. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it you is. You know, I do, I do some hacks. Like if I meet somebody... Um, you know, I've got the aging bladder, so I'm spending a lot of time in the bathroom. But anyways, I'll run to the bathroom and I'll just write down in my notes immediately the right. name and a description of that person and I'll save That's it. Good. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll put it on my cell phone. Um, Nick, podcaster, LA, Italian. Right. That's right. That's and, interesting. And so then I'll, I'll make a note of it and then I could follow up. I could look you up on Instagram. I could look you up on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And then that can deepen the relationship. And um, like even just, I went to the pro drum party. Mm-hmm. I, I've been wanting to go to the, the Hollywood pro drum party. For those that aren't in the know, this is an iconic drum shop that's been around for like 60 or 70 yeah, years. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's on Vine Street in, in the heart of Hollywood. And um, went to the Christmas party and like all of these famous Angelino drummers are there. And this is like, if a bomb went off in that place, the music business would stop. Right. right? There would be no more drummers in Los Angeles. And so I see Mario Caleri who played mm-hmm. with the Wallflowers. And, and, and we had just had like a, a social media relationship, kind of surfacey. I finally see him. I run over him. I give a big, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just, just doused him with uh, male love and he's like whoa that's a lot of energy coming at me right now and I said well man I wanted I was excited to meet you in the flesh because I saw you play with the Wallflowers in Deep Ellum in Dallas Texas in 1995 nice. and here we are all these years later but um you have some interesting thoughts on social media and the way we're using it like com- especially the comparison yeah death uh, by comparison what are your thoughts on that I I'm I'm worried I'm worried about how people are using social media and I think that social media is a great a great tool and I use it and I like I built my business on social sure. media so it's I can't free. so I can't I can't knock it um, my concern is the comparison and it's mm-hmm. easy it's easy to get on social media and look at what everyone else is doing and you know like everyone knows that it's everyone's highlight reel right so like if you just think about the shit that you post on social media right, right? i'm not saying you particular i'm sure. saying you anyone right like no one's putting on there like they're they're bad like days. they're bad days and like their shitty thing that happened to them it's all like this is the the 
famous person I met or like this is the gourmet dinner I'm having. And it's a highlight reel. And I think that if you're if you're looking at everyone's highlight reel day in and day out, you can do one of two things. You can use social media as a tool to inspire you and to learn new things and to really push you to the next level. Mm-hmm. Or you can use it to have you spiral downward into sort of, uh, you know, an envious depressive jealousy state and it's and and they've done studies on it they know for a fact that social media is not good for your psyche they know that for a fact they and they've also done studies and they know that you have the same when you get a notification on your phone it fires the same exact dopamine responses as it would if you took a drink of alcohol or like a line of cocaine or or smoked a cigarette or something. So we're like drunk that. and high all day as Americans. That's what it is. And right. and you get addicted to it. Right. And the addiction is real. Like that is it's not a oh, I kind of think no, you are addicted to it the same way that I mean, you can I got be. I gotta say, I mean anyone that meets me knows that I use it as a tool endlessly. It's part of my right. day. I start my day with it and I end my day with it usually. Um it's 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 been good for me, but I, I, one of the hacks that I do to reduce that anxiety, mm-hmm. no notifications. I don't have, yeah, any, I don't notifications. have any notifications. I just if I yeah. want to open the app, I open the app and I see what's up. Right, right. But to get notifications all day long from this person in 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 Australia that viewed your photo, yeah. like that'd be that'd but, be crazy. But like if you like if you and I were out to dinner and I got up and went to the bathroom, what would you do? You would grab your phone. I would probably open the gram. Yeah, and I'd get be on like. Instagram. Uh, What's um? What's my buddy Mark Shulman up to? What's my oh? What's our friend Kenny Aronoff up to? Like, right. it's, it's like it's like it's a it's like beep 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 beep. beep. We could see like Aquaman and the fish, like what a million people yeah. are up to at that very moment. And I guess my point is, why does it matter? It's at the I think end it's just of the a day, curiosity and a boredom, or what is it? It's I think it's an addiction. It's an addiction. Yeah. How many times do you mindlessly scroll through social media mm-hmm. and you're like? I've looked at these pic. I've scrolled through this 85 times. I already know. I've seen all these pictures. Mm-hmm. And you just keep going back and keep going. And I'm guilty of it too. I'm so not, you're, I'm you, not pointing You're a finger. scroller. Cause I noticed there's two ways to consume it. There's people that are, they take their, their feed and they can, they kind of live off of their feed. Maybe they don't right. have thousands of friends. They just have maybe a couple of hundred curated friends. And it's, and looking through the feed is, it's not unhealthy. Right. Like for, for me, I have thousands of, so I'm not a feed guy. I basically live on my page and whoever interacts with me through that page gets an immediate response from me. Got you. So Got I, you. so on all the platforms, I live off of my page. Off if, of your, no, like your, if, your if my wall or right, my, right. my, yeah. So if you interact with me, I'll interact with you. Got you. If you follow me, I'll follow you back. Right. But, but um, who has the time to do the feed? So, like I'm a, so I'm a scroller, right? Okay. And but I'm like I've gotten very diligent about it. Now like I delete the app off my phone. You get yeah. sick of it and you'll delete it. Not sick of it. I'm like I have to stop. Wow. Yeah. Legitimately, mm-hmm. you know, like I'm yeah. sort of like I'm like a drug addict, right? <laughs> and I'm like I got to I got I have to delete this. And if I want to get on Instagram, I have to download it and do all that and then when I'm done, I'll delete it again. Mm-hmm. Like that. And I'm not here I'm trust me, I'm not here to like demonize social media by any means my only point is one social media is not real it's not reality right like if you if you watched the spider-man movie would you be upset that you can't climb up a wall no because you'd be like it's hollywood it's fake instagram's the same way instagram is a highlight reel so i think that again if you if you use it for good Mm -hmm. like you do like you interact with people you're talking to people you know people are asking you questions you're back and forth i I get work through it you know it's like of course and i do too like i I, I, there's a lot of good that i get out of social media too i my fear is that people compare themselves to other people Mm -hmm. and and it makes them depressed and it makes them feel like they're they're not worthy less of than, something less than and not enough. Right. right. And, and you, you and you are. You are enough. And it doesn't matter that's the point. And we're like, all snowflakes and we're all so unique. It's like, you know, that's why when when we talk about drummers studying with different like you studied with Daniel Glass and you yeah. had something he had you soaked up things from him and then when it but when it comes out in that that information manifests itself in a in, in a different way through you because we're all so different. I mm-hmm. can go I could steal all of Greg Greg Bissonette's cool like soul 
solo melody ideas that he has. And when I play them, they're going to sound completely different. Right. Because we're all so unique. Yep. Yeah. The social, it is a, it is an interesting time that we're living in. And I know another kind of rant, not a rant, but it's a common theme in your pod, in your interviews with the 500 drummers is what do you think about the YouTube drummers? These crazy <laughs> kids get off my lawn. It's, but I do have to agree to you, agree with you when you've got guys that are literally just posting insane drum solos that does not get you work right why not post you videos post videos of you playing in a band or playing a song right because songwriters producers label owners bass players guitar players keyboard players chick singers are gonna hire you to play a song right right not I think play that's, 30 second notes that's uh, like for me that's the punchline right like, don't mistake something for something else right? right so don't mistake social media for reality don't get your self-worth from something that is not that is not valuable right don't mistake the drumming business for the music business mm -hmm. don't think that you putting chops on youtube is going to get you gigs if you're trying to get noticed as a chops drummer who wants more youtube subscribers mm -hmm. and wants to go that route then don't put yourself up there playing along with songs Put yourself up there playing chops. Yeah. And I think that's where the distinction is, is like understanding understanding the two, right? And not mistaking one for the other. And that's the that's the whole thing for social media yeah. or people playing drums on, yeah, if you want a, on YouTube yeah, or whatever. Yeah, if you want an audience for your drumming, why not do both? Have some drum solos and then have you playing songs of, in a wide variety of styles. Right. You know? I'm not even that. I'm, yeah. I'm more like, do whatever you want to do. Yeah. But just don't think that this is going to get you that. Mm -hmm. And don't think that that is going to get you this. Like, you just have to, for, to me, I'm like, you just got to make, you got to understand the difference between the two. Because there's a big difference between, the, as you know, the music business and the drumming business. Yeah. I mean, and, and there is, I, you know, I have a little, um, you know, other revenue streams in the drum business in the sense that I've cultivated trying to be a clinic for, a clinician for over decade right and and that is changing and growing and we have to constantly be evolving with the times you know um there's a lot of, uh, of drum shops that are closing mm -hmm. and and the big box stores don't want to put the energy and the effort into having a clinician come in they don't want to allocate their funds to pay the clinician so we're having to do different, like guys like stanton moore and uh myself and and kenny and mark shulman and sukerman we've had to like do like a cash model now where it's like okay I'm going to send the drum shop owner a flyer that's all ready to do, go. All you do is put the information into it and it's like whatever your price is for a two hour masterclass. And then, then I don't, we don't have to deal with like, you know, begging DW and Sabian and Remo right, and Promark right. for funds. So I guess that's just, uh, you know, part of a, an evolving, changing music world that mm -hmm. we're in, you know? That, I mean, that to me, that goes back to the, the podcasting thing mm -hmm. where like own your voice, mm -hmm. you know, like, we, it's cheesy to say, but that, like, that's what we say every voice. We're like, we believe that everyone has a voice and we'll help you find that voice. And once you find that voice, then you own it. Then and you, you monetize re, it. Then you revoice it. I like and that. It's a great name. It. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Now, uh, when you think about the seven years that you've invested in this You've highly focused on this. You had a laser focus on developing this podcast. You're monetizing right. it. It is the holy grail of drummer podcasts. Looking back at all the interviews from the who's who of the music business, huge drum celebrities, anything, moments in time or interesting stories or your favorite interviews or moments or nuggets? There's... I mean, there's a couple things that really... I've listened to like a lot of them. I know like, you like, a lot of them. I know you have. You'll like. You'll text me. And you're yeah. like, Oh, listen to this. You know, this episode with this or with yeah. That, I went back right? to the John Robinson episode today from like 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. That was a really good one. Um, the ones that really stick out to me are probably the ones that that people wouldn't think. Right? They're probably like, oh, Steve. Well, but Steve Gadd stuck out to me because he's like my favorite drummer. But, um, but it wasn't. Not, maybe it wasn't the high, the high profile guy. Like if you look at, well, Jimmy Chamberlain has been great because he and I have like developed a relationship because, and he he's like into Business. tech and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So we've talked, and he helps out with Revoice and all that kind great. of stuff. So, um, so that's been that's crazy because I'm like I'm on the phone with him. I'm like I'm talking to Jimmy Chamberlain, like not interviewing him. Rat just, in a cage. Like as a as a as a friend, and that's that blows my mind. Um, Chad Smith was like overly nice mm -hmm. and was like, you should come out to a show and like went out and hung out backstage and everything and like super nice. Um, 
but the two that were really that really blew me away one steve bowman who you know yes counting counting crows that, that was- august, august and everything record August and everything after is my favorite record of all, all time. time. Of all time, that's up there for right. me too. It's and a good one because I think the I think musically it's amazing. I think what what Steve played on those tunes mm-hmm. is it's like minimal, but it's so like big statements and everything. That's right. I listened to that record every single night when I went to bed for a year and a half. Right, so to have him on the podcast and then I met him at Pasic and I was just like, hey man, I like I love. That record, I know, and, and he's so humble. He's like, "Oh, shit. Like, yeah, yeah." And so that was like, that was a really cool moment for me. Mm-hmm. Um, What's other, up, Steve? Hey, Steve. <laughs> uh, the other one was Billy Martin from Modesky Martin and Wood, and he was the first guy who really made me realize that any of the any of like the the labels and associations that you make are you're making those. It's not other people. So he was like, it doesn't matter if you want to like play drums and like work at a record label or like you want to play drums and sell real estate and be an accountant and like Mm -hmm. do clinics and do, he's like, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. It doesn't matter. It's like, you don't have to just do one thing to be successful or you don't have to just do one thing so that other people don't, you know, perceive put, you in the wrong way. You in the wrong way. He's like, it doesn't fucking matter. Right. You know, and even Jason Sutter said the same thing. He was like, uh, you know, he's like, I got my real estate license, and he's like, for years, I didn't want to talk about it. And I'm not. He told. He said this publicly, like yeah. on the podcast. Uh, and then the art dealing and all that. There's a right. lot of facets. And he's like, I was worried that like that people were going to be like, oh, he's selling real estate. Like, is he not a drug? I'm like. And he's like, I, why do I care? He's mm-hmm. like, I'm on tour with Cher. Like, my, right. obviously, my career is still okay. Right. I'm not doing it because I have to. I just, it's just what I'm into. Right. You know, I mean, he's your, you know, a good buddy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Too, so. No, I mean, we talk about it all the time. He's like, he's like, I don't know if you should present the world that you're an up and coming actor because you're not successful at that yet, and you're incredibly successful at everything else you do. And I was like, I think it's just the the transparency of sharing moments in your life with your audience. I like it. You know, I I'm. I don't want to have a separate page for this and a separate page for that. It's just like, this is my life and these are all the things we do. And I think the the flip side of that too is if you waited, right? And say you land a role in like some big movie, mm-hmm. right? And they're going to be like, oh, of course he did. He's He plays in the Jason Aldean band. They like, just snatched him they up. They just snacked, snatched yeah. him up. They yeah. didn't see that like, no, I've been working at this for 10 years. Yeah, you I'm know? like and killing like, myself in classes and like right. going to, you know, it's yeah. it's been a grind for four and a half years. Yeah, you know? and I think that, that, I think being able to see that and to see where it goes, I think that's more exciting, you know, than, than being like, I'm here, I've arrived. And that's what, that's like my whole thing with Uncut. Like we're, I'm trying to build a media company right now. Right? right. Like I, as funny as it sounds, I'm like, I want to build it into like Endeavor. Like, like a Gary Vee situation? No, no, no. Like, uh, like, you know, do you know Endeavor? Like uh, William Morris Endeavor? Gotcha, like the, gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. I'm like, they, they do everything. They manage talent. They produce. Athletes. Like, and, they, athletes, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that's what I want to do. Nice. Right? I want to build it into that. Damn. So, is that possible? I don't know. And, it's completely possible. But, it, you know, it'll take a long time. And all that. But it's like, I can either show up on the scene once I've done it and be like, hey, I built like the biggest, you know, I want to be like one of the one of the biggest guys in Hollywood, right? And I'm like... That would be cool if I documented that whole thing. I mean, documenting the process is where it's at. Look at how it worked for Grant Cardone and Gary Vee. Yeah. They're sharing all the warts in all. What do you think about Grant Cardone? Well, I interviewed him. I know you did. And um, it was challenging because he, he doesn't like to be interviewed. He likes to do the interviewing. He likes to- He, he wants control. Yeah. He wants control. And so I had to fight and wrestle f- to handle that interview. Yeah. He's highly successful. I don't yeah. think money is everything. It's I not. feel like some, some maybe like Gary V, he's done very well for himself, but he's also very much about encouraging people from all walks of life and all ages of life to f- no matter what before their deathbed find their purpose. Right. Right? right. And monetize that purpose. Yep. Because there's no shame in loving something and then attaching a dollar amount to it so you can have a roof over your head and spend your time on earth the way you want to spend your time on earth. Right. And not have to go time to make the donuts yep. and then play the drums on the weekend, which is not bad. But right. if you want to play the drums every day of your life, you have the right to do that. Yeah. And yeah. make money from it. Yep. And I think, you know. And I get it, man. I left like a successful restaurant business. Right? There's too many and creative like, people that are, are, are 
guilty. They have thoughts of guilt and feelings of guilt about putting a dollar amount on their creativity. I call it time. I want to pay people for their time and talent. I stole that from you and I use it all the time now. And I'm like, look, we got to get compensated for time and talent. Time and talent. TNT. You know? You know what I mean? And I I totally ripped that off from you and I use it all the time. And if somebody comes to the table, like you helped me launch this podcast, I was like, I'm not going to have somebody wait. It's like Venmo. Right. You help me, yeah, yeah. I help you. And I think that's a, a, a good key to success is to surround yourself with like-minded people that maybe have talents that you don't have. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, I do my drum clinics and I've got my drum tech, John Hole, I've been working with for like almost a decade and he gets paid 10% because I don't want to lick stamps yeah. and send those emails that are the 20 emails that are associated in doing one drum clinic. Right. So he's hyper-organized, helps me. And he makes ten percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, and you know, like yeah. a lot of the a lot of the times, it comes down to like, could you have done all of the stuff that I did for the pod for your podcast and everything? Yeah, yes. Like you could have figured it out, and like, but it's like, do you want to spend no ten hours doing it? You helped me cut to the chase, exactly, really quickly, right? And I think that that's a, that's a valuable thing too. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, yeah, um, uh, you know, we were saying about. Not necessarily uh, building relationships, but it made me think of that. Like how finding like minding like minded people, mm-hmm. and how do you how do you go to people and start to build a relationship with them without feeling like you're needing something from them? Because I think that you do a really good job at it. I think mm-hmm. that I'm pretty good at it too. Like, yeah, I, I mean, you can speak to it because like building our relationship. Well, you like, talk a lot about that in the in the podcast where you talk to people and and a but lot, like when we first met, yeah. I, like I mean, yeah, I was like, I, I need some advice and I want to talk to you about some stuff. But did you feel like I was like like needy or no. or like no no? You get a lot of the same questions all the time. How do I do this? How do I do that? Right. But um. I've always felt that if you want to, whatever success you have in life, if you want to keep it, you have to give it away. Right. And freely share. So that, how do you do it now? That like doesn't if, mean I don't you do wanna, consultations. You do consultations, do. right? So yeah, yeah. you have to put a, a dollar amount on the T and T. Right. I'll answer an email or right. like, I'll jump on the phone with you for a few minutes and yeah. like walk through some stuff, whatever. But if you're like, Hey man, can you help me like put the step by step? Together? So I, you gotta, I, right. my time is the most valuable thing I have and I, I have to charge you for it. Right. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what about you? Like when you're building relationships, because you're like where the level that you're at now, you're like, of course, you want to get to the next level, right? Mm-hmm. You want to meet people who are doing things that you're not doing, right? So how do you connect with those people without without seeming needy or like you want something? From yeah, them? you know, yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. You know, it's like, uh, you know, my girlfriend Kara, she always says, you know, what's really sexy in Los Angeles, the fact that you play country music and you play with a huge country music star because. LA is all like hip hop culture and everybody just listens to hip hop and all day long. And no one ever talks about what you're a drummer in a country band. So she goes, everyone in in LA is an actor. Do not lead with that. She goes, your conversation, your moment of interest is opening with that. You're a drummer in a major band. Right. And then if you can read the room and you get good feelings about the person, you can say, I've been studying acting for four and a half years. I study with Leslie Kahn. I've got my SAG card because everybody leads with, I'm an actor. Right. Waiter. And that, I was going to say, it's like, oh, you are? What restaurant do you work at? And so Kara was so funny the other night. We went and we ran into a fellow friend of mine I took a class with and she walks in and the place is like super noisy. And she goes, he, I'm like, this is my friend. You know, he's an actor. We took a class together. And she goes, are you a working actor? Like right away, she went for the juggler. Like, are you a working actor? It was hilarious, right, and the right. guy was all like, uh, um, you're, uh, "Like, <laughs> like, well, yeah. I mean, I've done some like commercials." And, <laughs> right. and she just cut to the chase, man. It was so. But I like um, but I don't know. I think you just have to have a. You know, when when they have when people say that you have that gut feeling about someone, you right. know, that's our birthright is that's like that intuition is a God given thing. Right. The ability to pick up and some people have a higher developed sense. They're like, they're empaths or they feel things, you know? Um, yeah. And just, and then just being, you know, persistently polite and then finding a common ground mm-hmm. with people. And like, I have a friend, uh, Chris Beals that is like, now he's taking all of my video segments of the podcast and mm-hmm. he's cutting them up and creating little teasers and stuff. And, and it's like, uh, how much do you need per episode? And you shake hands on it and, right. you know, right. I, yeah, I don't know. I like, it's, it's funny to see, like to look at relationships that, that I've built over the years and, 
thinking about like how they came together and like, Mm -hmm. and some just, you know, some work and some don't, but I think that like, I see it a lot where guys are just, and like you and I have some mutual friends or like mutual people that we know that we're both like, man, that guy's just like a little over the top. Heavy hang. Yeah. Yeah. Heavy hang. Heavy hang, man. And for me, I'm always just like, anytime I'm, anytime, if I'm trying to get connected with someone or I want to like start to build a relationship with them, I'm just like, I'm just going to give. Like I just give as much as I can, you know, yeah. and I'm like, hey, yeah, oh, I can, help. I'll connect you with this person, and yeah, you know, give and give and give, and you will eventually receive. Right. Don't expect the receiving, but usually you'll be pleasantly res- uh, surprised right. when you when you um, exceed people's expectations. You yeah. know. Yep. So those are your moments on the podcast, right? I mean, so if you're if you're a drummer, we're talking like the drummer for uh, David Letterman band. We're talking about uh, Jason McGurr from Death uh, Death Cab. Death Cab. We're yeah. talking our, about our friend Jason Sutter, who lives right up the street, who's out with Cher right now. We're talking about guys like Josh Freese, who's one of the most recorded drummers in the last twenty years. Mm-hmm. Kenny uh, Aronoff, I had Ken, yeah, I mean, Kenny Aronoff, uh, Bermuda Schwartz, yeah, used the Schwartz. Dude, do you know he's been playing with Weird Al Yankovic since? 30 30 years. 1983. Now that's a gig that keeps that's on getting. That's what you want. If you're a creative out there and you want to be a, a t- attach yourself to a brand, I mean, it is harder to do nowadays more than ever because ultimately there's a lot of entertainers that are not loyal. Mm-hmm. especially out here where there's like some new chick singer that gets signed to Hollywood records. And the first thing she's going to do is that they're going to go try to find a band leader over at musicians Institute and completely underpay those kids. Yep. And if they eventually make the cut and they last, they get past the first tour, what are the chances they're going to come back for the second tour? Right. And it's like, so for me, like with a Jason Aldean, it's like we played for five drunks and turned those five drunks into 50 people and then 500. And it took 20 years to do that. But right. God bless him. He saw that we were like-minded people. He saw that we got along as friends. He's, he recognized our musicianship. And he right. said, why change it this yeah. is great i can i can build this career with my friends mm-hmm. i wish more of that existed yeah i wish uh, if you're an entertainer out there and you're listening put a group of people together and respect them appreciate them pay them and keep them yep i agree you know yep. you've got a team for the podcast i do i mean i was yeah. looking uh it's the, funny uh, that you were saying that i was like i don't look at it any different than like Starting a business and making sure that everyone is yeah. appreciated and paid. You got Kirsten, uh, you got uh, Tim on business development, you got Justin, your producer, you got Tom- Tomas, your Tomas editor, Shana, yeah. you got Rachel, your artist relations person, you got Catherine on graphic design, and a lot of these people are all drummers. Yeah. I just hired a couple new people. Too. You just, I mean, yeah. talk about like-minded people. I, I always think that the drummer is usually usually one of the most business-minded people in the band anyways. Yeah. Usually yeah. the drummer of the band is the person that's like, I do all the graphic design for the record covers right. or I- It's not going to be the bass player. Book us or never the bass player. <laughs> bass player is too busy checking his hair in the mirror. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> that is rough. So um, I know for, for, we were talking about social media. People can find you on social media at the Nick Ruffini, right? Yeah, the you know, Nick Ruffini, and it's R U F F I N I. Yeah, the whole R- story about I don't yeah. I didn't want to be the Nick Ruffini. Well, it's it's everyone was different, and right. I was like I want them all to be the same because it was Nick underscore Ruffini or Nick Ruffini music or this, or that. Yeah. and I was like I just need I was like the the Nick Ruffini. But you're the Rich Redman, aren't you? I I'm a uh, Rich Redman on all the socials, but my email is the Redmond oh, right, at right, Gmail. Right, right. And so okay. it's so funny when you're on Southwest Airlines or something and the lady's like, your email address is T H th- Red, like the Redmond. <laughs> it's the, my last Theremin. name. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, um, is there anything that you, that you, uh, wanted to cover or promote new projects? I know as far as like services, You've got Revoice Media, mm-hmm. and is it revoicemedia.com? Yep. And you got nickrafini.com, yep. R U F F I N I. Um, you have the podcast, drummersresource.com. Mm-hmm. People can find you on the socials. You're really good about getting back to everybody. Mm-hmm. You have a coaching program for drummers. I do, yeah. And so you, people can go to drummersresource.com and they can click on, and you have a free ebook. Mm-hmm. So you can click on drummersresource.com. You got a free ebook, stick exercise. What is it? Yeah, stick control. Stick control. Well, it's, it's stick control uh, on the variations. Drums. Variations. So it's like it take it, you work through the book stick control, and it's like eleven different exercises that you can use with stick control as like a companion piece to Great. work through the different exercises. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody needs a free ebook to help with the. You know, essentially, it's like 
I want to capture your email address. I want right, to keep in right. touch with you for the rest of your life. Exactly. Um, it worked though. I mean, there's a lot of people on that email. Totally. So I sent out, you know, I sent out an email every Friday just with the recap. And but like the main thing is like just go to the site and listen to the podcast, man. There's 545 episodes. And I love you have little other nuggets. You'll do little when you'll have a, an idea. You essentially have like a like a like a, uh, art meets commerce. You have thoughts on it, and you'll just do a little 15 minute podcast, yeah, yeah. which is always really nice. And most too. of them stem from an interview and then like we'll be having a conversation about a particular thing. And I'm like, Ooh, I can, let me, let me expand on that and talk about that particular thing or, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just, they work. Yeah. Any other th- nuggets or information you want to share with the world out there? No, no, I mean, that's all I got. What did we not but, talk about? We talked about, we didn't talk about your parents' wine business. That's my family's wine. Yeah. Business. That's not my parents. Yeah, oh, it's my, it's my it's, family. In Italy. It's like your family name. It's so my uh, my cousin married a woman named Daniela Pepe, mm-hmm. and Daniela Pepe's father is Emilio Pepe, and Emilio Pepe is the name of the of the vineyard. So now my cousin Chiara and her mom uh, and my cousin pretty much run. Well, they all Emilio is still alive, and yeah. he's, he's eighty something, but they make like really high end. We, we saw it when we were, yeah, we went to Italy. Yeah. So what is it called? If people are wine drinkers, Emidio Pepe, E M I D I O. It wasn't cheap wine. Oh no, it's a couple hundred bucks a bottle. I mean, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. And you speak Italian, huh? I do. So yeah. how often do you get over uh, the pond there? Though? Uh, usually like once a year, yeah. we have a house over there and nice. Uh, so and the rest whole, of the time you're in Santa Monica, right? That's a whole other story. Talk about grateful. I was in, I was in your hood yesterday. Yeah, because I don't have a hair I don't have a hairdresser in Los Angeles. I just really quick went in, got my hair cut, and then right it was like right there on like Santa Monica and Fifth. There's a taco truck, and yeah. I was like, you know what? I haven't had a tamale yet. So I went and I got this epic green chicken tamale, ate it on the street like a construction it. worker. Yeah. It was like mouth crack, man. Yeah. So I get my hair cut down there, like uh, ooh, Salon Republic. Wow. No, I go to, man, I go to like a little barber and it's like 20 bucks and just pop in. So, uh, Lincoln Barbers, shout out to them. They're the, they're the best. But, uh, but after I get my hair cut every day, I'm like, I'm going to see the ocean. I just go down two blocks and just peep the ocean. Mm, I don't like, get the Santa Monica much, man. I, I just, a lot of seagulls. It's the, just, it's the uh, beach. I know, man. I know. I know. I'm more landlocked. That's how this works. We got to get, we got to get, um, the brides out. We're going to do we're, that. We're going to go to Italy, Italy because I mean, we're right up the way from we should that. go to Italy. That's Italy. We should go to Italy. That's yeah. what we should do. You stay in our house and Oh my god. Yeah. Is there like a certain season you go to do that or like Usually spring or fall. So like April, May or like October, November. Oh, April would be mm, I think maybe October, November. Anytime. That, that could that Anytime. could that I could, mean there's no like it's literally there's no one in the house unless we're there. Mm. So Guys, this has been an amazing conversation. Our buddy Nick Ruffini, founder and executive producer of Drummer's Resource and Revoice Media. Media. Uh, check out drummersresource.com, revoicemedia.com. And he does some consulting, some coaching. You want to start a podcast? You want to f- the fast way to get there? All the things you got to sign up for, register for, link to, subscribe to. Nick can help you with that. <laughs> and uh, he's a great guy, fantastic musician. And it was a real pleasure to spend this time with you, man. Likewise, man. Thank I love you. it. I appreciate you. Big shout out to our folks here at this wonderful studio. I got Nettie behind the board there. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you to my co host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your concerns. You want guests on the show. You want to give me feedback. It's an easy email address. The Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. Of course, we'd always appreciate a five-star rating. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. Keep coming back for the good stuff, and we'll see you next time. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.